Thank you very much. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm very happy to be with you here today in this uh, very interesting conference. Um, my name is Flavia Micilotta, in fact, and I am the um, executive director at Eurosif. Eurosif is the European association that promotes um, sustainable and responsible investing in Europe. Um, we work through our members in order to advocate and research on uh, responsible investment topics um, with different stakeholders, mostly, of course, reg regulators in Europe. Um, we were very happy to notice throughout um, the past few years how our community of responsible investors has become more and more important for policymakers. And I think it's fair to say that today, issues around sustainability, of course, not only climate change, um, but responsible investment in general, have become more and more, um, you know, on everybody's mind. Um, happy to see that, you know, there are conferences like this, uh, discussions, roundtables. Um, indeed, policymakers are making efforts to um, look at these issues when they draft policies, when they think about their policy frameworks. Um, our job is to make sure that they go on doing that and to give them good ideas and to point them in the right direction, of course. Um, today, we heard through our keynote speaker, um, you know, some of the issues that, of course, our community of investors is really pushing forward. Um, we talked about fiduciary duty, which is indeed a main um, um, topic when we're talking about investing and how much, and I think it's very important for our community of investors to push forward on the value of environmental, social and governance criteria to come forward clearly when we talk about a notion of fiduciary duty. And this is something that we advocate um, foremost. Um, we also push forward for um, more transparency on ESG criteria in general and more shareholder activism, of course. Um, next, we have Anne-Catherine, Anne-Catherine houston uh, Novetic CEO. Anne-Catherine is an expert on responsible investment. She led in 2001 the development of Novetic, a research center dedicated to sustainable economy. In addition to defining the editorial slant of Novetic.fr, Anne-Catherine publishes L'Essentiel de l'ISR, a quarterly publication for the French-speaking financial community which provides up-to-date information on international responsible investing practices, extra financial analysis and shareholder activism. She was promoted Chief Executive of Novetic in 2006. She's a frequent speaker at events on sustainable finance and often interviewed by the French media. Please, Anne-Catherine. Thank you very much. Um, I try maybe to, to focus on uh, a very a strong issue of disclosure and reporting is uh, we have now a huge market of responsible investment in Europe. You will uh, publish the figures uh, of the European market in November, but we, since years, since 15 years, we measure the French market. And at the end of the day, we have now uh, 746 billion of euros in France, which are integrity in a way or in over ESG analysis into asset management. Uh, it means that we really measure how ESG analysis is integrated into the process because if we spoke if well, for the just exclusion, if you just exclude, I don't know, controversial weapons or something else, we measure it apart and it's more than 2,000 billion of euros. But we are really focused on how ESG analysis is uh, transforming or not, it's the, the subject today, the asset management. Does it mean that you use ESG analysis to build some different portfolios or not? And uh, we measure for the first time these figures to try to identify what part of these 546 billions are really have a strong impact, you can find a strong impact on the portfolios at the end of the day. And it's just 54 billions. We uh, just measure that there is in France uh, 54 billions which have, which is managed by uh, four, uh, 14 asset managers have this kind of practices for their all their SRI assets. So that's good news. But the other news is what is the purpose, and that's my, my subject, what is the purpose of responsible investment? We have in France a market which is really led by the asset managers. And asset managers couldn't be the leaders of responsible investment because, as David said, they are not the 
real owners. They don't give the leadership about what kind of ESG criteria they want that the asset managers uh, uh, will be will have to use, and that's really the main issue. So my point is uh, to underline that we are now we have a huge market, but the question is really we need to focus about what is the purpose of all these assets. Do they have the purpose to change and to have really strong environmental and social performances as they have financial performances or not? And the point is that we need to have some uh, asset owners and asset managers and savers who said that they want both. They want all of that. They want environmental performances, they want social performances, and they want also financial performances on long-term issues. And uh, how it's possible to change now. Why? Because we had uh, COP21. And COP21, with so many investors who have a strong commitment on climate change, really changed things. Because if you uh, have taken some engagement, you say, I want to have, for example, Caisse des Depots, Novetic is part of Caisse des Depots, said they have, they measure their carbon footprint, and they wanted to have less, 20% uh, uh, their carbon footprint has to move uh, has to be under 20% of the level of this year in 2020. So to do that, they need that companies change their manners. They need that companies really have some the, the same kind of objectives. So when you are in this kind of responsible investment, you need really to have uh, you need really to make uh, yes to make change, and uh, that's why we measure. Uh, we measure the links and we publish a lot of surveys in English and in French uh, dedicated to the links between responsible investment and the commitment, uh, commitment on climate change. We are now around more than 1,000. Uh, the last figures were uh, at, the end of, uh, at the end of 2015. Most of them are PRI signatories and many of them are the signatories of the Moral Carbon Pledge, and we will measure with the PRI, and we will analyze what kind of report they do uh, in July, because we want to try to analyze this, to analyze how uh, these asset owners and asset managers they explain how they measure their carbon footprint and which kind of results they have. Um, I think it's just for you, because we publish it just for you, uh, to try to have a quick uh, figures about how the, the countries, uh, which kind of investors in which kind of countries uh, do this kind of commitment. And you see that uh, US, but they are bigger, so, <laughs> but in US and in UK, they are really a very strong understanding be, be, by uh, strong by big uh, asset owners and asset managers about the carbon risk about climate change impacts on their portfolios it's quite strong as you can see in france also because uh, maybe in i uh, you will have also this slide which uh, shows the um, differences between asset owners and asset managers and you see that there are uh, in us and in uk it's more asset owners than asset managers who do that the point in France, and uh, I will uh, I will end with that, is we have really a, a strong business case, uh, in a French way of doing things. But we have, <laughs> if, uh, because you know that we really believe in law, <laughs> and so we are the first country to have a law uh, on energy and ecological transition, which which was adopted last summer, and this law for the first time has an article and creates a new obligation for asset owners to uh, disclose to have disclosure on how they manage carbon risk the biggest one the other one the, the smallest has an obligation to explain how they integrate esg analysis in their uh, asset management in their mandates and that's really something because at the end of the day, we just have 12 asset owners signatories of UNPRI. So you, you can imagine that there is a lot of people who really don't have a clue about all these issues, but they have a law. And the purpose of the French 
uh, assembly is to have a law to oblige people to think about that, to try to have some uh, knowledge about that, and at the end of the day to report on that because, and that's really related to the to the purpose of this morning, to explain to the savers how their savings are managed into uh, with. Um, does they manage carbon risk or on something? And that's one thing. And the other thing is a green label uh, launched by the Ministry of Environment, uh, which is the first, I believe, green public uh, label for pro financial products, which, is fo which are focused on uh, eco-sectors. And please hear me, they exclude nuclear energy. Yes, you hear <laughs> nuclear energy and fossil energy. It's also uh, it's also true. We can uh, I, we can prove that because we are auditor of this label, and there is also an exclusion of controversial companies. Uh, it was just launched in March, and we have now six funds uh, labeled with this green label. Thank you very much, Anne Catherine. Next is Stanislas Dupré founder and global director of uh, Two Degrees Investing Initiative. Stanislav founded the Two Degree Investing Initiative and now serves as global director. Previously, Stanislav was executive director of Utopi, a CSR consultancy. After a career as CSR consultant and R&D manager, Stanislav has been working on Two Degrees Investing topics since 2007, when he developed the first assessment methodology for financed emissions of banks and diversified portfolios. In 2010, he wrote a book about the role of financial institutions in financing the energy transition. Thank you very much, Stanislav. Thank you. So um, I will basically uh, focus on the, this French law that um, anne Catherine mentioned. So briefly about our organization, so we're a think tank. Actually, we opened an office in Berlin like a month ago. Um, so we produce research, so a lot of things I will mention, uh, you can find more details on our website. So we produce research on metrics, uh, climate related metrics for investors, on financial risk management with a focus on this question of short termism uh, and misalignment of incentives uh, within the investment chain, and uh, financial policies. Uh, both on disclosure and on, I would say, like uh, carrot and sticks, uh, like uh, tax incentives, monetary policies, uh, this type of stuff. Um, so what I uh, will uh, specifically mention is this uh, uh, law on mandatory disclosure for uh, investors in France. Um, so we basically help design it at the different uh, stages and um, the investor in the room will probably receive a, a letter soon uh, inviting them to uh, candidate to uh, climate disclosure awards we co-organize with the French government um, with the idea to foster the development of best practices and set the bar in the context of the implementation of the law. Um, yeah, I will skip that. So we also help to we also manage research project to produce the metrics and tool that can be used by investors to implement this law uh, and potentially a similar uh, disclosure scheme in other countries. So I will uh, focus on the law. Basically, there's two objectives, and I think this is an important uh, innovation uh, with this law is actually to clarify the objective. What's the use case? Uh, because reporting on carbon is great. But if you don't know what you want to achieve and why you do that, it's basically useless. So I think the, the important aspect in the law is that it clarifies two goals. Uh, the first is the idea to report on the contribution to achieving climate goals. So this idea that investors can play an active role in uh, implementing the Paris Agreement uh, and basically have an impact on the cost and availability of capital. And they are required to report on this first aspect. The second one, which is more prevalent in the Anglo-Saxon world, is uh, this idea of um, assessing and managing the value at risk related to climate risk, both physical risk and the energy transition uh, risk uh, for the companies and their investors. Um, so I think first aspect is there is a clear, a clear distinction between those two objectives, and they are like different. They, they require different metrics and different actions for investors. Um, the second thing is, and here I think the, uh, actually the law and the implementation guidelines are less clear, is uh, what type of data you use to measure that. 
Uh, and here, the uh, law doesn't say a lot. And the implementation guidelines mention basically four things. Uh, one is the dependency on natural resources. So is your business model dependent on the kind of uh, uh, consumption of oil until the end of the days? Um, your exposure to green and brown technologies. So do you have like renewable, what's the kind of uh, share of renewables you have in your portfolio versus uh, cold fire power plants, for instance, to give just a few examples on sector specific stuff. Um, the um, capex plan of the companies. So are the companies in your portfolio investing in the right direction in line with the um, objective of the uh, energy transition? And if not, what could be the value at risk related to that, the potential impairment they are exposing themselves to? And the last but not least is, because it's probably the main thing investors have in mind right now, is this question of past and future CO2 emissions associated with the assets. So one important thing is like, uh, you probably heard about this law already, and usually it's mispictured as like mandatory carbon footprint for investors, which is absolutely not the case. Uh, first, that's not the indicator that is uh, required by the law. There's like kind of this uh, potential shopping list. Uh, and second, this is not an indicator that directly address the objective. It's not a risk indicator per se, and it's not an indicator of uh, contribution to the energy transition per se. It's just underlying data that you can use to fit the analysis. Last part is the uh, disclosure. So basically, um, investors are required to uh, disclose the result of the assessment of their portfolio, according to the two goals I mentioned. How they integrate this in their investment policies. Uh, so stock picking, uh, sector allocation, voting policies. And, uh, and that's probably the most innovative part in this law. Uh, they are required to set quantitative targets and explain how these targets are uh, aligned or not with uh, the Paris Agreement and the French uh, decarbonization strategy. So that's basically where we are. Um, and I might develop on all the issues related to the implementation of that and the next step um, during the debate. Thanks. Thank you very much, Stanislas. And now I would like to give the floor to uh, Dr. Dionysia Theodora Avgirinopoulou. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is an influential politician regarding environmental matters, a specialized attorney in international environmental and sustainable development law and project finance, and in the recipient uh, and the recipient of the Green Star Award uh, awarded by the UNEP, OCHA, and Green Cross International for a leadership in prevention, preparedness, and response to environmental emergencies. As a member of the Hellenic Parliament, she has held the positions of the Chair of the Special Standing Committee on Environmental Protection and the Subcommittee of the Water Resources, as well as the Chair of the Permanent Standing Committee of National Defence and Foreign Affairs. She is currently the Chair of the Circle of the Mediterranean Parliamentarians of Sustainable Development, the Director of the European Institute of Law, Science and Technology, and a member of the Steering Committee of the Global Water Partnership Organization. Dr. Avgerinopoulou has been selected as a young global leader of the World Economic Forum and one of the 40 under 40 European young leaders. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me here today, especially thanks to Share Action and also the Young Global Leaders Initiative on the SDGs, on the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, some of us that we belong to the World Economic Forum, and we are between the age of 30 and 40, or a little bit uh, more than that, um, we really believe that shaping our future means to turn all the investments. Well, we're very much um, optimistic, I would say, to the serving the Sustainable Development Goals. I think we're, most of us, familiar with that, 17 goals that global societies would achieve between now and 2030. And they span, like they span all the sectors of human activity, but 14 out of 17, they relate to climate change, environment at large, environmental protections, um, especially on water, on the protection of the oceans, on renewable energy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So whoever wants to see the SDGs being implemented would really um, like to 
force the green agenda, the environment agenda. And these SDGs, they go very closely, very well, hand by hand with the goals of the climate change agreement in Paris. And the majority of the legislative and policy proposals that society, global society has taken over the last years. And the thing is, the question is, is this too optimistic, we cannot do it. And the answer is one and very clear, and it is my uh, message today. It is not difficult to achieve green investments and inclusive and smart um, development, sustainable development, for one simple reason. And this is the same reason that everybody speaks about green finance lately. Because green finance is not only um, responsible finance, but it is profitable at the same time. So at least to my understanding, the reason why all the funds gathered to the climate change negotiation process in Paris, and I hope that I will not insult anybody by saying so, is exactly because financing, investing, in renewable energy or in new technologies regarding climate change or in green infrastructure, this is the way to go if you want to become rich today. So it is easy for us environmentalists to promote the green investing agenda. And one reason, uh, one uh, proof for that, um, that I would like to provide is the tables of the European Environment Agency. So the European Envi Environment Agency made a measurement about all the investments that took place in Europe in the last five years. And let me remind you that we're in the middle in a financial crisis that began like 10 years ago, and now we're getting out of the crisis. So these measurements took uh, place in very difficult times. And the results of the European Environment Agency were that only investments in renewable energy and environment-related projects were really profitable. So if you see the tables, and I'm sorry that I didn't bring that to me, but because I came directly from Myanmar here, so I did not stop by my office, is the fact that all sectors, investments in all sectors, they're either stable or they are decreasing. But for the investments in environment and energy, and this is very helpful for both investors so that they know that if they invest in green uh, portfolio, their investments are kind of sure and they're not that risky. And also for the environmentalists or for the governments that they are looking to attract investors. So they do have this big argument in their hands that you should go ahead and invest in our projects because these are good for the public, for public health, for the environment, for development, for job creation, and also for your assets, for your money as well. The thing is, however, that we have a problem between communication of different worlds. So on the one world, we have the financiers, the people that traditionally are working in finance up to now, the asset managers, etc. And up to now, they were not very well informed about inf environmental issues. On the other hand, we do have the policy and the lawmakers that they might not be aware of both of the worlds, either finance or environment. So you have to educate policymakers and lawmakers about these fields as well. And of course, we have the environmentalists that, or the people that are working in research and they don't know how to access the funds. And I think that on behalf of the role of the policy and lawmaker is also not only to create a favorable uh, policy and legal environment, but also to inform and educate all these shareholders and also bring them together and this is why you're doing also a great job to that so and I don't know how much time that I have but but I would okay I would just like to quickly share with you a few initiatives that I have taken along with um, my colleagues over the last years and then I'm open to questions for that uh, well, first of all, as the chair of the Environment Committee of the Hellenic Parliament, I took one year out of the work of the committee in order to uh, educate the rest of the members of the parliament about financing opportunities on behalf of the European Union, of course, and global financial opportunities. 
in order to make them understand why they should change the regulatory environment that we had in Greece and make it more stable and more favorable for investments to come into Greece in these specific fields. And I think we did a little bit of a good work to that. And because the, the meetings of the parliament were open to the public, they were um, actually broadcasting through a TV channel, we had a raise of interest and also between uh, the financial sectors in Greece and the, um, the holders of the assets that they had no idea that all these financing opportunities existed. And we had actually managed to have some good matches and B2B conversations because of this educational process of the committee. And then, actually, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm the chair of the uh, Circle of the Mediterranean Parliamentarians on the Environment. And we represent 26 parliaments around the Mediterranean, including both developed and developing countries. And there was a bridge of information and guidance, especially for the developing countries, that they needed to have access to finance. And I think that it is important, all the uh, initiatives that we take to educate these people about how to have access to finance. And also two other sets of countries that we're addressing lately with a global water partnership. The least developed countries, as I mentioned, I just came back from Myanmar, and Myanmar is one of the least developed countries that, however, presents a great interest in green investment. It's a great opportunity for investors and a great opportunity for the people and the environment of a country to attract investments. And the seeds, the small island developing states that are mostly actually uh, threatened by climate change. That's all. I will continue later. That's excellent. Thank you very much, Eunice. And Catherine, um, of course, your presentation touched upon labels as well. Uh, we all know the role that Novetic is playing, not only in France, but also in other European countries. Uh, my question is, what is the role of labels today? What do you think their future can be? And um, what is the main difference, you think, um, of, of the labels that you, know, you developed in France or the label that you developed in Germany with one of our In partnership members? with the with FNG, FNG, which is members the in Germany. The, yeah. So what, what do you think the different connotations of these uh, labels is? And what do you think they should be, uh, what their future should be? Uh, to try to make the link, I think that you are right. Maybe the demand is growing of the real people who want to real asset management. And uh, we want that this asset management is taking account uh, ESG analysis. But uh, we see that in the French market. Uh, five years ago, a third of this market was uh, retailers, was real people. <laughs> but uh, but uh, now it's just 10%. So it's really the market, the responsible investment market is not really addressed the, the, the retailers uh, right now. And why? Because I think if there is this demand, you need to have products which are aligned uh, which are coherent, as you say. There is no tobacco, but also no nuclear massive destruction because uh, there are there are some links between both. And uh, so that's why, because as far as you know, responsible responsible investment is not an obligation. Everybody do what he wants. Every asset manager, every asset owner has his own definition. So labels are very useful to put on the market. Uh, standard. First, and the, the experience of Novetic was launched in 2009, and the idea was first to push transparency. How far, far, how are you accountable of your customers about the way you are integrating ESG analysis? But now it's not enough because the point is how, as I said before, what is the purpose and what kind of performance you deliver. For the, for the returns, because you have now in France, and thematic funds are really working well in retail, uh, in retail because they want green assets, and they, you, have, you will find green products. So I think, and we, we, there is uh, the, the, the German forum, uh, FNG, which is uh, here with uh, Claudia, has decided to launch a label for the German market, which is not really the strongest of Europe uh, in a way, because 
when you are thinking about the, the big, uh, the, the size of the German economy, uh, it's not really the, 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 the pension fund are not so vocal on these uh, issues and so on. So the, 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 the interpretation of the FNG was we need, with a label, we can push all this idea because we can push retailers, we can push the savers to think about that and to understand that, as David said, they have a power and this power is really related to responsible investment. But we see that uh, it's not, uh, the idea is easier than to the implementation. We are now in the second year of that. But it's a tool, but it's a very useful tool if it's a known tool, if really savers can, for example, when you want an organic product, you, you are looking for a label which is a guarantee that this product is really organic. We need to have the same, but I need that we are quite far from that with the label. We really have some experiences. We launched the, the, the Novetic label on a European level, so we, we have really a strong interest of many markets, especially in Netherlands, in Belgium, and so on. Uh, the, the next step, and we will think about that for, uh, for the next years, is how we create Related to all of the things uh, said here, how we create a kind of label, like an organic product, which can be uh, a tool for every uh, European retailers who want to have strong ESG portfolios and strong ES SRI products. I think it could work, but uh, uh, we that it could be maybe some of the delivery of all this uh, this network today to have this kind of standard. We know how to do that. We need uh, some partners, and we hope to have that to do sometimes. Um, maybe a question to, to both of you, to you and Stanislav, because I'm not doing very well in terms of time management. <laughs> and I would like to give the floor to you now. Um, just a quick question. Uh, you, well, you of course, both French, you're both very much involved in the, in the local scene, um, and you both very much advocated for the, for the French law on energy transition, which you talked about. Um, what do you think uh, are going to be, the we, we can already uh, see them now, perhaps, uh, in France, the repercussions that Article 172 uh, will have, not only in, in the French market, but also in Europe? I think it's a key issue because um, the law understood that they have the key of the civil economy described uh, before. So if you push all the asset owners, and I was talking about the, the German asset owners, they don't do a lot. So if a law can help them to oblige them in a way to think about that, to do something about that, and to uh, really incorporate that because they are they have the key of the the savings and they have the key of the economy and so they can shift the trillions to sustainable economy but i think there are really a few of them who are aware about that so this law is a tool another tool but it could be a very useful tool to oblige the subject to put the subject on the agenda because we need really to do more that to do more because there are so many markets uh, which are very strong. Uh, if you see my, my slide, you see there are not so many markets where there are so many asset owners or asset managers dedicated to that. We need to do more, more quickly, and uh, law could be uh, European law or European directive, or I don't know, it could be very useful. Stanislas, what's your point of view? Um, so I think the so first uh, there there is definitely an interest in this uh, law and the way it will be implemented. We already start working actually with other governments to try to export the framework. Um, the other potential implication will be I think there's a, you probably heard of this uh, climate disclosure task force uh, launched by the FSB. Uh, I guess there's like. Uh, what, what, what will happen in France might inspire uh, the conclusion. Um, but I think there's also a lot of things to learn from um, the content and the, the, the challenges related to implementation. So I think one strong aspect I, I stressed uh, is this idea that the law clarifies the goal. Um, and one thing that worries me, and I think it will be a, a huge challenge for the implementation of this law and in other countries, is uh, basically uh, what's related to a sentence of uh, Mark Carney when he uh, introduced the task force, which is what gets measured gets managed. So I don't know who strongly agree with this statement in the room. 
few of you. Okay. So I my experience working with companies on disclosure and investors on disclosure is like what gets measured might get communicated, uh, gets audited, might get you on stage to tell a nice story, but definitely that did do not get automatically managed. Definitely not. Uh, I think it's like uh, disclosure is an enabler and uh, actually managing and acting on the, on the data requires carrots and sticks or a clear uh, business case. And uh, my understanding, and uh, as you as you just stressed, um, so basically there is a kind of narrative where long-term investors and fund manager would be like uh, have a kind of alignment of interest with society in managing this climate risk. Uh, I think if you if you really stick to the facts, um, like asset managers basically turn their portfolio every two years. Uh, the way an analyst work is to uh, forecast the cash flows of the companies for the next two to three years and then extrapolate that. That's the way it is, which means that risks that are unlikely to materialize in a time frame of 10 years are just not on the radar screen. So my, I think this is uh, their, the next step and the important challenge for the implementation of this law is actually to crack the use case and understand um, if you expect investors to act on this, uh, especially policymakers, they will need to just figure out that the kind of disclosure is like data that can help to act to introduce uh, carrots and sticks to uh, work on uh, tax breaks to uh, like change the incentive systems. But if we don't design these disclosure schemes with this in mind, I think it will just be reporting in a vacuum, basically. Thank you very much. And now I would like to quickly go to Dionisa. And well, Dionisa, you bring us a bit more, of, bit more than European perspective, right? Because uh, um, uh, the work you do and the countries you touch upon uh, with CompSud also include uh, non-European countries. Like, so I would like you to to discuss with us a little bit how how do you think uh, our side of Europe compares um, in terms of uh, promoting sustainability through uh, financial markets and responsible investing. Actually, I have good news to that, yeah. because I think that uh, Europe is indeed a leader in sustainable development. And um, I was really, and we are quick as well, although we don't think so. I was really impressed when I returned back from Paris, from the negotiations for climate change, um, that within four days after the end of the, the, um, the adoption of the protocol, the European Union, DG Klima, had already um, published a call for investments in third countries in order to uh, promote uh, investments in climate change infrastructure. So I think we are quick and I think we can do it. And we're definitely leaders in that. However, what the problem with the, the European continent and above it is, is that we do have the policy orientation and the vision for Europe uh, and the world, but we don't really are able at this moment to go into details. Let me just give you an example of the Juncker plan, which applies for Europe. Uh, the Juncker plan, which is the investment plan for the future of Europe, um, has some amount of money gathered and it really um, aspires to match it with additional funds coming from the private sector in order to build the sustainable Europe as we all dream upon it. How And they say within the text of the Juncker plan that at least 30 to 35 percent of these investments should go to sustainable development investments regarding renewable energy and general environmental related infrastructure. And when you go to implement the Juncker plan to the countries, uh, you don't really see investments in renewable infrastructure or environment. Um, I see investments in tourism, investments in food chain, investments in other type of um, businesses, but not this 35% that Juncker plan and Europe wants to achieve in green investments. So we should go really down into detail to educate people, to inspire people, to oblige through not only soft law and policy papers, but also hard law on these targets. Otherwise, we're not going to do it. Not globally, not in our house, 
as well. And of course, globally, since you ask about it, I do think that the European Union with its neighboring policy instruments and the cooperation that it has with many vulnerable countries, actually, is going to be really a leader in that. I was uh, in a discussion with the cabinet of Commissioner Mimika, which is the Commissioner for International Development, and we are trying to figure out how we're going to raise more funds about the small island developing states. They need infrastructure to tackle climate change. They need infrastructure to really uh, combat coastal erosion. If Europe does not help these countries out, these countries have really limited capacity to respond to these vital for them challenges. So we have a responsibility and we have a capacity to help. Thank you very much, Tunisia. Um, so I'd uh, like to open to questions, not too many. <laughs> I see already a lot. Um, I don't know how can much I time we have and how many questions can we take, I can think. Can I... Can we all keep our questions really quick? So can really quickly? In lots of questions, that'd be great. Okay, can I ask you to uh, state your name and the organization you represent, please? My name is Dustin Neunayer from the PRI. Just quickly, it's more a comment. I think there's actually one aspect missing here a bit. I mean, the financial sector, as well as politics, uh, from time to time, and depending on the region, have been a bit isolated. And if we look at the innovation that we have seen during the last year, it has been from come from regulation. But if you look, we had financial crisis, we had Volkswagen, we had Panama Papers, we had tax avoidance. I mean, what is behind this and what is behind policy? It's actually what is societally accepted, so to say. It's the wider society that changes pretty much here. So we really should think about how we keep this link. And this goes down if we look along the investment chain. We talk a lot about investors and investee companies, but where's the beneficiaries? This is just beginning. And uh, also if we look, for example, for the EORP directive. So it's really, there's a key. But parliaments, you know, it's not about only becoming rich. It's also about becoming elected for it, you know. Thank you. I think that was more a comment, not a question. Okay. I mean, the gentleman in the second row. Um, Lars Jensen from Ansvarlig Friend in Denmark. Uh, to me, the French law is the gold standard of the regulation we would like to see on climate change. Congratulations. As a member of the European Civil Society, I would like to see the same laws passed in Strasbourg and in Brussels. I know who I voted for in Parliament. I'll write him a letter. Uh, which council is it in? Uh, do I write my ECOFIN representative or my environmental representative? Where is, I know my own commissioner, Margrethe Vestager, who is the commissioner, is very strong on green. She drove that very much in Danish politics. She'll be open to that kind of policy. Is it her directorate? Um, if not, how's the commissioner there? Where's Juncker on this kind of thinking? And Europe has our own Donald. Where's Donald Tusk on this? Jeroen, would you like to quickly answer that? Because I think it's directed to you. <laughs> So you basically asked, to whom do I have to write? Uh, How do I, as a civil society, influence that policy? Look, I, I, I think... political question, of course. Yeah, yeah but I, I think what you have realized, it's a cross-cutting issue. It's, it, it's fortunately not one commissioner or one council that's dealing with this. This pops up in so many areas. I mean, you gave the example about the, the neighbor, neighborhood policy, where you can use conditionality. I think it's a very good example. That's the enlargement commissioner. Uh, you can think about the environmental commission, but it's not just an environmental issue. It's also a financial sector issue, which is Lord Hill, who is in charge of the Capital Markets Union. So um, I think I would write in your case to Donald and to uh, Jean-Claude. Excellent. Uh, we have another question, the gentleman in the third row with the striped shirt. Thanks very much. Hugh Wheeler, Managing Editor of Responsible Investor Magazine. Quick question for Jeroen. Uh, you mentioned um, the, the sort of uh, fairly classic response from policymakers around an issue like the ESG, ESG directive, which is to look at transparency and look at driving demand. I think those were the two you suggested you might be able to do some work on. You, you, you've been around these kind of um, issues for a long time. What do you actually think the Commission 
can do, uh, bearing in mind the responses that you've had, which, um, you know, they read like a long list of all the problems that many of us uh, who've looked at responsible investment for a long time will be very familiar with. Um, they're very difficult to, to get around uh, and they require some quite deft policy making that, that's clear and easy. And I wonder where you think you, uh, you can take EU policy on this. Um, when you say you've been a long time around and not much has been changed, then, then I feel a little bit <laughs> like I'm part of the problem. <laughs> I, I think what we discussed a bit before, um, what is very important is that these kind of issues come out of the niche policy and that they are mainstream issues. These are issues that concern all of us, everywhere, everybody, every organization, every company. So, um, from a policy point of view, I think it's, it's important to get this really on the agenda, not of just the Environmental Council, but really uh, whether it is UNEP or Paris or everywhere that this is being discussed. That's one thing. A second comment I would like to make is, we always speak about ESG uh, as such, but we should not lump them together. Uh, there have, has been an important study that made clear that those companies or investors that take separately environmental, separately social, separately governance issues, um, get a far better, clearer, clearer picture of where, for instance, a company or an investor stands. Now, I can give you one, one good example, Volkswagen. Volkswagen was very high in the sustainability index of Bloomberg. Top sustainability, very well, world class. But they forgot a little bit the G issue, the governance that came out, and, and that is basically driving the company down. And uh, so all these things need to be addressed in a separate way. Uh, is this transparency? I still hold up that transparency is, is very important, but it's only a tool to get somewhere. And to come back to your first question, I mean, all these things we discuss about uh, transparency, disclosures, uh, discussions, high level agreements, wonderful. But behind that, there's a real world that we, we, we see a need to change, and we don't have a lot of time. And there's a real expectation from our brothers and sisters' parents is really something happening in all these wonderful conferences. And uh, I think we should not forget that. You mentioned Panama Papers. I'm happy you brought it up, because for me, the Panama Papers is, again, a real governance issue. How do big companies deal with their taxation obligations? Now, nobody likes to pay taxes, uh, let's be clear about this, but a reasonable amount of taxes everybody should pay. And I think that has been lost a little bit at AE for big companies, big investors, to be as smart as possible, to be extremely aggressive in, in paying or non-paying taxes, and the Panama Papers are an illustration from this. Maybe it was legitimate, maybe it was correct legally, but there is a big moral and ethical question behind all that. Thank you very much, Jeroen. Now a question for the other panelists, maybe. <laughs> Gentleman in the red shirt. Particularly encourage women as well to yeah. ask questions. <laughs> Hi, Sebastian Gonino with WWF Europe and Policy Office. A question to Anne-Catherine. Um, you mentioned that there's now a huge responsible investment market, but for what purpose? And in 2015, there was a game changer which was two, um, two high-level global uh, um, goals agreed by the international community. The first one was the Sustainable Development Goals, and the second one was the Paris Agreement, two-degree alignment, which actually more precisely is well below two degrees towards 1.5 degree, which is important. Um, do, you, do you think investors will commit to align their portfolio towards, the, I mean, towards these targets? Will you ask them in the questionnaires you send them in terms of objectives they will set themselves? How do you think this could be done? And a second question on disclosure to Jiren and, and Stanislas. Um, there are enabling conditions to make sure transparency is relevant. One is to make sure you um, disclose uh, meaningful and relevant uh, data, key performance indicator that makes sense for a given company in a given sector, which requires uh, um, reporting frameworks at sector-specific level. And the second one is, um, is comparison and, and harmonization of standards. And again, sector-specific approaches are, are required. And this is something that is not present at all, nor in the, in the non-financial reporting directive, nor in the French law, to make sure investors or companies will report both on meaningful indicators and indicators where they can be compared 
compared with the peer companies. And if it's not done, it will risk to be useless for, um, for disclosure. It, there is an example, it was done already in France 10 years ago, the French government required the companies to disclose ESG data without any guidance, and that led uh, Total um, giving transparent data on their uh, water consumption for the Paris headquarters. Or BNP Paribas disclosing the rate of recycled papers for their Paris headquarters. I mean, what's the relevance with a core business model about this? So, w what do you think could be done to address these key issues to make sure transparency will have a use? Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. And Catherine, would you like to go first? Yeah, I try. Um, I know Sebastian since years, and uh, we change in a way because at the beginning, like many many people, we found that. If you do something, it's good enough because you be, you begin. It's uh, it was the niche time, and now we are in a time that you need to deliver, and that's why we try to measure uh, what I said before. How, what is the impact of asset ESG asset management, and it's related to your point about disclosure because the idea of the French laws since many years is you have because an obligation of reporting and disclosure, it's acceptable by lobbies. And that's why there are this kind of uh, obligation because they can. it's really difficult to say no. It's impossible for me to report. And so that's why we have this kind of obligation. But the point, the idea of the regulators was if you have an obligation to report, you have an obligation to build a strategy to organize your reporting to the purpose of your reporting. And it doesn't work like that because there are many factories of reporting in many companies, in many investors. We really don't know why they do that. And Stanislas said that very well. Um, our point now, and it's really challenged, and uh, I'm part of big battles in many areas, about uh, what is the purpose? My main uh, uh, sentence is, if you do responsive investment to change nothing at all, it doesn't isn't, it's not useful and irrelevant. So uh, we organize surveys and uh, lobbying and discussion and talks about what is your purpose, how you measure your impact, and that's why we publish these figures. And I was quite surprised because it was just one week ago, and I believe that uh, I will have more enemies at the end of the day because I just said that there are only 54 billion of strong SRI uh, in France. And I think market has changed because uh, people could accept that. And we really try to work on that. And it's really something like a network with, between the, the leader in company, the leader in investors. And there is, and to explain, and it's uh, the job of journalists, to explain the links between Panama Papers, financial crisis, and all the things we do on with passive investment. There are some things, but we need to do more to uh, help people to take this, uh, to take this as an advocate uh, tool. Sorry. Stanislav, uh, would you like to address the question yes. on materiality, I believe? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's. Uh, I mean, I hear a lot of time, like, um, we are uh, going in the right direction and, like, uh, doing a lot of efforts. But if basically, if you have a breakfast tomorrow in New York, you don't take a bike. Um, and uh, that's what we are seeing right now. Like, uh, I think if efforts and right direction is good, speed is matters. And uh, if you take disclosure, I think, like, Basically, for the past 15 years, companies have been required to report on consolidated emissions um, at group level, um, supposedly to inform investment decision of investors. And when you actually try to integrate this as a fund manager to take meaningful investment decision, it's absolutely useless. Useless. I mean, it's totally useless. Uh, if you want to inform risk management, for instance, you need to actually perform proper financial analysis on each security, what uh, CEO, the CEO firm, for instance, I see Nicole in the room, uh, does. And this require totally different, a totally different approach. You need to understand what are the kind of physical assets owned by the company, how they are exposed to different uh, regulation in different countries. So it's totally different. And I think we lost basically 15 years uh, on this because there were no focus on the user and the use case. Uh, and so I think this is, and we still, to a large extent, see that in the uh, 
policy making process and in the, the, sha the, the shaping of uh, disclosure uh, frameworks right now. So I, I think this topic start to be a little bit on the agenda, uh, but there's still a lot to do uh, to make it like the core uh, driver of uh, investment disclosure frameworks uh, design. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to maybe allow for one more question. Really quick one. Preferably from a lady. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. This is a question for Dionysia. And you began your remarks at the start of the session sort of articulating a very optimistic view about how the financial system is going to align itself over a period of time with the sustainable development goals. And I think you know everyone in the room would like to feel that as well. But I think it would be very helpful to hear what you see as the sort of policy actions that are missing in the near to medium term that really take this broad set of sustainable development goals that touch every sector and how do we move from this sort of very patchy environment we're in right now, where there are some sort of cherry pickable investing opportunities that are sort of easy and in reach for many investors, and these other very intractable problems that relate to smallholder agriculture, women, uh, water. You know, some of these things really are not, they just don't look familiar. So I would love to hear your thoughts about the policy role since the session is about policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and your question actually tackles two different things that I have in mind. And the first thing has to do with main, mainstreaming. It is very important for all of us, and especially also the investors, to understand that investments about environment and the SDGs is not only direct investments on renewable energy and environment, but it could be investments in many sectors. Agriculture is, I think, one of the best examples. We can and we should invest in agricultural measures. It is very important. Forestry and environment at the same time, to go together. Water management, as you mentioned, the SDG 6, it is very, very crucial. It has to do with sanitation, with public health, with the good management of our water sources, the underground sources, uh, potable water, etc. And of course, the women issue. Actually, some of the main conferences on SDGs lately around the world, they address the issue of women and water and climate change and all the vulnerable uh, situations that could arouse uh, regarding the women involvement in this. So it is very important that policymakers take into their minds the SDGs in every kind of policy that they develop and every kind of legislation that they develop. The difficult thing is, however, as I told you in the beginning, to educate the policy lawmakers. In many countries, people have not even heard about the existence of the SDGs. So if you don't know what the SDGs are and that they exist, how are you going to um, actually integrate them in your law schemes? So first of all, education, information, and political pressure from the public to the lawmakers is very important. And then you have to find, as you asked, the key players. And for me, regarding policy developments and law development, some key, um, key people that we forget uh, is the European members of the parliament, the members of the European parliament, the work of the members of the European parliament is much more pivotal and much more influential than the local policy and lawmakers. Because it is the European Union with its, with its institutions, primarily the European parliament that should be and is the enabler of this policy change that should happen. And then we should see this policy change not only through small and tiny laws, but also in our larger um, legal frameworks. I was just thinking during this meeting today that actually in Greece and in other countries, we should change a little bit our constitution. We have now a big development and big discussion that is taking place in Greece about the change of the constitution. And nobody thought of actually changing Article 4 and Article 17 about the businesses and entrepreneurship and about the meaning of ownership, respectively, to change the meanings, the notions, the basic notions of our uh, society, of our laws, of our finance. If we don't do that, if we don't, if we don't uh, change what in Germany they call the Grundrecht, the basic law, then the constitution then you cannot really go down and convince that you have made a change as a society. But then, 
acting locally and speaking to the policy makers that are in your region and also in your uh, tiny laws, it's also important. We have to act in all these different spheres and that takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of courage and that takes all of us together to work. We cannot do it otherwise. Thank you very much, Tunisia. I think our time is up, so uh, please join me round of applause to uh, thank you all my time. Thanks, everyone. Um, just a, a little addendum to that discussion, which is that obviously a critical function and purpose of this Erin network is to facilitate citizen investors and civil society organizations to be much better organized in terms of the policy engagement um, with at a European level. Um, and, and I think that could be one of the, the most powerful things that as a network we, we managed to do, to really put the, the citizen investors' voice into the policy process from a multi-country level in a way that you know, could be you know, very, very influential. So that what you're doing in Denmark, we, we mirror it and we make sure it's happening in France and in the UK and in Germany and, and in Greece. So um, watch this space on that. Now, the next part of the day is about um, getting to know one another. Um, and I know that the temptation 100% is to snuggle off and have a chat with someone you already know really well. So don't please do that. In fact, try and make an effort to meet with someone from another country um, and maybe from another sector. Uh, and what would be wonderful is just to have some really short conversations. We, 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 it's speedy, it's gonna have to be even speedier than we thought because we've um, overrun a teeny bit, very excusably. Um, but if you could have maybe three six minute conversations with another person, then we're on our way to creating a massive web of new relationships out of this conference, which would be a wonderful achievement. So share why you're interested in responsible investment and what you bring um, to this conference with other people in just a few minutes and then swap around. We'll do it outside and then you'll be rewarded with a delicious lunch uh, around half past 12. <laughs>